pray, shall we? Father, we come before your throne of grace again this evening. We ask for your presence, your guidance. Thank you for your promise. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, we're going to continue. This is part four of Christ's message to Laodicea. I mentioned before that that bef the, uh, before we can give the three angels' message, we must understand the message to Laodicea. The message to Laodicea is the message of righteousness by faith in Christ alone. It's the same message as the third angel's message, but this was in specifically for the church. Not for outsiders, but for those who claim to be believers. Then the third angel's message, that's what goes to the entire world. But it will not go without our preparation, accepting the message and going with it uh, in, in the power of Christ. But <clears throat> I want to uh, read a little bit. We won't read through the whole passage again, but in verse 14, this is uh, chapter 3 of, Re of Revelation, message to Laodicea. <clears throat> Christ is the message and the messenger. And um, verse 14 it's to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And we looked at this verse uh, three times, I think or so, that Spewing out of the mouth means the word the word that he uses is I'm so sick to my stomach. I'm about to vomit. That's the real meaning of it and then um, We drop down to Verse 20 this we're gonna we already looked at this before we're gonna do a little bit of review and go on from here he says that Behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So <clears throat> this is the message that God has given to us and for us. And uh, <clears throat> just a bit of review. Uh, I mentioned before that Christ is the message and the messenger. Uh, to the last day church. Last time we considered the repentance of Jesus from Psalm 69, that he, he was made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. And Christ repented, not for himself, but for us. And uh, we considered that last time. And then we we looked at uh, Matthew and also uh, we'll look at uh, another slide in uh, Ephesians 1. When he came up out of the water, he knelt and the Holy Spirit was there in the form of a dove. The Father himself was there speaking. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And Christ uh, recognized that he was the representative of the entire human race. And so God's voice to him is to us also that we are accepted in the beloved. And in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse three, 3 through 6, says that we are, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's number one. Number two, we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And these are four, uh, four things that we can be absolutely sure of all the time. Number three, we are predestined to be conformed to his image because of Christ. And then number four, this in verse six, says that God has accepted us in the beloved. And this is the thing that was going on <clears throat> when, when he said, uh, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased when, uh, when Christ was baptized. We also considered the outline of church history from the time during the Dark Ages through the Waldenses, Huss, Luther, Calvin, Anabaptist, Wesley, William Miller, and the Advent Movement. And these are some of the teachings that came out during that period of time. We also looked at it this way, that uh, <clears throat> the early church was the formation of God's people, 
Then there was a deformation from during the Dark Ages down to the, uh, the, the bottom of uh, the uh, Revelation chapter, the, the, the middle of the churches of Thyatira. That was the end result of the deformation. And the Reformation came in, and the end will be restoration. And that's part of the message to Laodicea. We looked at this briefly too, that uh, there was steps down from Ephesus all the way to Thyatira, then Sardis would be the, um, the uh, uh, Protestant Reformation where the, God was restoring, beginning to restore his people. Philadelphia, I think we discussed that. What does Philadelphia mean? Philadelphia. Yeah, brotherly love. And uh, uh, at the, meaning, the meaning of Laodicea, and that's what we're dealing with primarily. It means a judgment of the people or a people judged. And uh, also, we're going to look at the, the purpose of the judgment is at one, at coming together with God, at one meant with God. And uh, that's what the atonement is about, that we might be one with him and then one with other people. The great day of atonement began in 1844 when Jesus began his work in the second apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. Christ, again, is the messenger and the message from the heavenly sanctuary, from the second apartment. And he, in his me message of righteousness by faith, prepares people for his wedding. And that's part of the Day of Atonement, there are, four, there are four things we'll look at. Four items that are all talking about the same thing as far as the work of judgment. We considered this, that in 31 AD, Christ was crucified. That same year, he began his work in the heavenly sanctuary. The first apartment, uh, we see him walking among the candlesticks in chapter 1 of Revelation. And then chapter 4 and chapter 8, there's a picture of the uh, offering of incense. And the incense represented his perfect life of righteousness. That's when we pray to him, he mingles his righteousness with our prayers and they're wholly acceptable uh, to the universe. And but there's two, two uh, areas that we approach God with, the death of Christ and his life. We need both, his death and his life. And then in 1844, he began his work of the pre-advent judgment, or <clears throat> we call this the, day, the great day of atonement or at one month. The work of Christ and the Father is to bring the human race into harmony, of uh, eternal harmony, and that's what's going on right now in, in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, there's something else. Whoop, for some reason, we missed we missed a picture dropped out on me. I had one here of a of a bride and a groom, but here's here's some more. Um, a wedding is probably the most joyous occasion uh, in the experience of, uh, of a couple. And one uh, in recent months, Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan, uh, they've been in the news quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, uh, here's another, another picture of them. But in, uh, in Revelation 3.20 that we mentioned earlier, in the first part of Revelation 3.20 alludes to the Song of Solomon regarding the Shulamite's troubled evening when her beloved stood out on the outside knocking, ever knocking for entrance. And that's the same picture we have in the book of Revelation. Christ is standing on the outside knocking to get in and finding out if, he, if we're going to let him in. Now we notice the parallel also between uh, the Song of Solomon and also Revelation 3.20. And uh, the, these, this, these are the passages here. The Shulamite said, I sleep but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks on the door. And you remember we were, we noticed that he stood there knocking and she, she was complaining that uh, she was in bed already. She'd taken her bath, she'd washed her feet and she didn't want to get up, didn't want to get her feet dirty. <laughs> and so as, uh, as the bridegroom was knocking on the door, she said, I'm tired, I'm, I don't want to wash my feet, I don't want to get my feet dirty. And so he kept knocking, then he left. And then when, as he was walking away, she jumped out of bed and ran to the door and he was gone. And then she went through the city looking for him. And uh, so that's the picture. But in Revelation, he says, I, uh, in fact, this is the only, the only verse in the, book, uh, in the New Testament 
that is connected with Song, Song of Solomon. There's no other ones like it. And, uh, but in verse 20, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, if anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. And uh, this comes from the Song of Solomon. Now the voice of the bridegroom in uh, the Song of Solomon, open to me, my beloved. And Revelation 3.20, uh, pretty much the same thing. Now we're going to consider the high points of the Song of Solomon, the book of Leviticus, and also Daniel 8. These are all dealing with the same thing, but they look at, this, they look at the judgment from three different angles. Uh, uh, the, high, the high point in Song of Solomon is that the uh, at one meant between the two coming together as uh, bride and, and, uh, and, uh, and husband. Here is a, uh, the, center of, the center of the Song of Solomon is chapter 4, verse 15. 5, 1 is the response. Uh, chapter 4 is uh, the Shulamite is inviting, uh, finally they, they got together. Actually, it's, it's a, a chiastic, chiastic, chiastic structure. <clears throat> and it deals with the coming together of the bride and the bridegroom. And uh, years ago, there was a study in the Sabbath school on the Song of Solomon. And that's where I got this from, where there are 100 lines, this is, there, this is speaking about Hebrew, 111 lines from chapter 1, verse 2, to chapter 4, verse 15. And the same amount of number of lines from 5, 2 to 8, 14. And so the center of the, of the book is, uh, is this coming together of, of the bride and the bride and group. Now, we have the same thing in Leviticus 16. The, the high point in, the, in this book is, there are several things. There are laws for the sanctuary, for the priests, and for Israel itself in the first 15 chapters. Then after chapter 16, you have laws for the sanctuary, the priests, and Israel, and that's from chapter 17 on through uh, 27. But the high point is chapter, chapter 16. Up to uh, 16, you have the message and experience of justification by faith. And then after that, you have sanctification. But in the center of this, you have the atonement or atonement with God. And uh, you have the same thing in, in the book of Daniel. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Chapter 8, verse 14. And leading up to this, you have the historical part of Daniel, chapters 1 through 7. And then the 8, uh, 14, that's the climax of, of the book of uh, Daniel. And then on the other side, you have the high point, of course, verse 14. And then from verse 17 on, you have interpretation uh, in, uh, in, in this. So we've got, this, but the center point is... Daniel 8.14. Now, we want to come to a Jewish wedding. They have, uh, this would be the conservatives. As far as I know, I don't know if all of them do this, but it's still being practiced. The day of the wedding is likened to the day of atonement. And it's a tremendous illustration for us of the wedding of Christ with his people. And, uh, uh, and the Jews had it for a long time. But <clears throat> the day of the Jewish wedding is considered a minor Yom Kippur. And it is customary for them to fast on this day. The Talmud, which is a, selection, or a, a um, collection of Jewish law and thought, teaches that the bride and the groom, on their wedding day, all their prior sins are forgiven. Sins result from a person's preoccupation with oneself and one's own desires rather than being selfish, or uh, non-selfish by committing to the other party. Both of them come together on the Day of Atonement to uh, deny themselves and consider themselves giving themselves to one another. On the day when a man and a woman enter the greatest commitment of their lifetime, they resolve to make their own interests secondary 
to the welfare of their spouse and the needs of their marriage. And so they abstain from food and drink on this day. Now sometimes it could last all day long, but sometimes if the, if the wedding's in the morning, they don't fast as long. They start, I think, at dawn or say six o'clock in the morning. And then whenever the wedding takes place, if it takes place in the afternoon or the evening, the fasting goes on much longer. But the, the marriage itself is the, is the breaking of the fast. So to a Jewish couple, fasting is an appropriate preparation for their wedding, which is a spiritual union as well as a physical. At Yom Kippur, the, one of the blessings is when they hear the shofar, and this is every, uh, every year, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, Master of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to hear the sound of the shofar. And that was that, that's that ram's horn. That they, have anyone here hold, uh, heard, heard the, the ram's, ram's uh, um, I've, I've heard it, it's, uh, it's quite a, well they, they can play different sounds on this thing, but it uh, kind of it's a plaintive um, sound. Here is uh, some, confession is the centerpiece of the High Holy Day liturgy. Acknowledging and asking forgiveness for the individual and for communal sins. So here you've got both the individual and corporate confession of sin and the cleansing of sin. And the high point, as we've mentioned again, Leviticus, Daniel, and the Song of Solomon all have to do with cleansing in preparation for a wedding. And of course, to be the wedding at one moment when uh, people come together both in a marriage but also in the marriage of the Lamb and his bride. In uh, uh, Matthew 22, I think we ought to read that, I guess. Uh, chapter 22 and also 25 are dealing with, uh, with a wedding. Tw 25, of course, of the, the ten virgins. But in chapter 22, we have an interesting situation here in that the king puts on a wedding or an invitation first before the wedding. And probably beginning with, with verse 9, you can go up even back further than this, uh, where the, the invitation went out three times. And then verse 9, it says, he says, Therefore go to the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with guests. In verse 11, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in? How did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. What does the wedding garment represent? Righteousness. Christ's righteousness. This man was speechless because he was Christless and he was not allowed into the wedding. But the pre preparation for the wedding, uh, Revelation chapter 19 talks about the, the uh, Lamb's wedding. The preparation is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We need to be covered with his righteousness, both on the inside and, uh, and on the outside. But, uh, and then chapter 25 talks about the same thing. Uh, we won't read that uh, right, uh, probably not tonight. But there's a, rela there's a relationship between marriage and the judgment of atonement or at one month. In chapter 25, we'll touch on this one. The bridegroom came, they were that ready, uh, were ready, and, and you, we become ready by the righteousness of Christ, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So this shows the end of probation, but it's in, the, it's in the figure of a wedding. Both chapter 22 and chapter 25 are dealing with the Day of Atonement, the Judgment Day, and it's in the figure of a wedding. The bridegroom came, they, they were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut, as we already saw. The relationship between the judgment and the marriage is that both are occupied with the one principle of at one moment coming together. The work of examination of character is described as the same event in the following four passages. In uh, chapter, well we've already read uh, chapter 8 verse 14. 
that certain one, in fact, let's, maybe we ought to uh, take a look at this. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 14. If you have the King James Version, I, I've got the New King and it doesn't have it here, but in verse, um, verse 13, it says, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, giving both of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled under foot? He said unto me, this is that certain one said unto me, for 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That certain one, uh, the original language, and it used to be in the, the old King James, it had palmoni, or palmoni, and in the marginal reference it says, the secret numberer, uh, or the, um, what was the other, two, there are two things, the Oh, the, wonder, the wonderful number in the reveal of, se of secrets. And the word wonderful is the same one that you, is used in uh, Isaiah that says, Unto us a child is born. He's called the everlasting father. Wonderful counselor. That word wonderful is the same re related uh, to this palmoni here in Revelation, Daniel chapter 8 verse 13. That is Christ. Christ is the one who gave the 2300 day prophecy. We need to remember that. This was, he did not leave it for the angel. The angel were asking him, but that certain one, Palmoni, answered and says, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So this is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, in the framework of this, of, of judgment. But, uh, so that's one. A, number, a, a second one is uh, chapter seven, verse 13. And let's, let's go back to this one because here we have the Son of Man coming, um, nine through nine, and, well nine and ten is a picture of the judgment where the Father has come together, the Ancient of Days. As you see it, the thrones are being set. By the way, the throne is a living throne; it's not something that's just stationary. It moves. If you want a picture of the throne of God, look at uh, Ezekiel chapter one and chapter ten, where it has m movement. Uh, and it, it's the throne of God moving by the cherubim. And in, uh, in chapter 7 and verse 13, he says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given a dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Then, if we drop down to verse 18, it says that the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Now, Christ does not receive it for himself. He receives it for us. He's the head of humanity, and as such, he receives the kingdom, but he gives it to his people. And this is repeated three times in this chapter. If you could drop down to verse 22, is the second time. It speaks about the Ancient of Days coming. A judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. The time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And so this is, this is the second picture. Then you could drop down to verse 20, 26 and 27. The court shall be seated. They shall take away his dominion. This is the beast to consume and destroy it. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So three times you've got Christ coming before the throne, or the pictures of him, receiving the kingdom, but three times he gives it to the people. But he's the head of it. He's, as human, he, he retains his humanity throughout eternity. He's at one with us and will be that way for eternity. Amen. Now, in, uh, we have another picture of this foretold by Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And uh, in this, we have Christ coming to his... Uh, uh, he's the messenger of the covenant, and he comes to purify. I'll get there pretty soon. Chapter 3... 
and uh, beginning with verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then, it, uh, well, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years, and I shall come near you for judgment. But this is a positive as aspect of judgment. Then he goes on to show that those who will not be involved in it uh, in the next few verses. But this is a picture of the, uh, the purification. Remember we read earlier, well, two or three times already, in Revelation 3.18, Christ says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And that's the faith of Jesus that uh, he went through, but also he gives it to us in our trial of faith. Uh, is all, it's like a purifying process. Then you have, we already looked at this, the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage, described by Christ, by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. And you're familiar with that, we won't go into that. But coming back to the Matthew 22, the same figure of the marriage is introduced and the investigative judgment is clearly presented as taking place before the marriage. This, from the great controversy, this work of examination of character, of determining who are prepared for the kingdom of God, is that of the investigative judgment and the closing work in the sanctuary above. Great controversy, six, uh, four, uh, get it, 428, I'm getting where I can't read. Um, again, uh, this is a summary. The four descriptions of the pre-advent judgment. We've gone over them, but I wanted to just make a point. Again, Christ is the messenger of the everlasting covenant, and he comes suddenly to his temple. This is the closing of the, of, of the probation, but before that time comes, he's going to cleanse his people by fire. We've already looked at Mal uh, Malachi chapter 3. Then again, in uh, Daniel 7, 9 through 14, he comes as the Son of Man, to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to receive his kingdom. When he receives it, he comes back and gives it to his people. And then again, Matthew 25 and 22, Christ as the bridegroom coming to his marriage. The wedding invitation is sent to everyone. Remember it says both good and bad. But in the process, those who do not want Christ are considered bad and they will be cast out of the kingdom. The king investigates to see if the Guests are wearing the wedding garments, and it'll be Christ's righteousness. The time of the pre-advent judgment uh, for the wedding, that's, come, that's from uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And then we must not forget the wedding garment, because we can't get into the marriage of the Lamb without a wedding garment. One's already provided. Uh, God has furnished it for us. And that garment, as we've talked about, is the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we, yeah, we can't get in without the righteousness of Jesus. So the pre-wedding and the pre-advent judgment are one and the same. And they look at the same thing from different angles. And the, the marriage one is, is a good relationship, or shows a good relationship, but like a husband and wife. And Christ wants to be the husband of his people. Christ. Now, we're going <clears> to <throat> talk about... Uh, a modern day wedding. The center of attraction involves two people, the flower girl and the bride. Isn't that right? All eyes are upon these two women. Everything else is uh, peripheral. <clears throat> now, the, the flower girl, of course, she's bringing uh, flowers usually up the aisle by herself. Sometimes there will be attendants. Does she, do you think she knows what's going on? Probably not. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. <clears throat> not at all. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
she knows she's in this she knows she's in this ceremony but she's thinking of something else the cake and the ice cream at the end of the ceremony that's right isn't it <laughs> what or it could be the floor yeah but she's interested in cookies too uh, now what about the bride herself she has eyes only for the bridegroom. You ever noticed as the bride stands there drooling, sometimes passing out, <laughs> as, the, as the bride walks down the aisle, his eyes are glued to hers and hers to him. Now, Laodicea is like today, she's like, the flower girl. She's interested in the, the rewards, the cake and the ice cream. But there's going to come a time when Laodicea is going to grow up and she's going to have eyes only for Jesus Christ. As he gazes at her, she's going to catch his eye and she's going to be totally in love with him. And when she understands that message, She'll be prepared to give the three angels message of Revelation 14 and chapter 18, verse 1. So God is trying to grow us, and that's through the purifying process. And once that's happened, once that happens, then we'll, we will stand before him clothed in his righteousness. Here is, uh, let's go to Revelation 19. This is the, the picture of what will happen and we can't miss out on this. Chapter 9, and uh, beginning with verse 7. Oh, I'm sorry, 19. Uh, yeah, thank you. Chapter 19, and beginning with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. She makes herself ready by accepting the robe of Christ's righteousness. Then verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, the old King James. But we need to remember that that is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's given to us. And we can own it because it is a gift, but it's, it is still his righteousness. Then verse 9, there's a blessing upon it. He says, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And so when this takes place, in fact, we might be able to <clears throat> take a look at uh, Psalm 45. This is actually a wedding psalm, and uh, <clears throat> that fits in with the wedding atonement, the motif that uh, is the gift of Laodicea. Chapter 45, and um, beginning with verse one. In fact, it's called the Song of Love and uh, it's the Messiah and dealing with the Messiah and his bride. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty, and in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the hearts of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, is God, is, uh, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And this is recorded in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, speaking about Christ. You love righteousness, hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. 
All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces by which you have made, which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women, and your right hand stands at your right hand stands the queen in the gold of Ophir. So this is the picture that we have of uh, of Christ and the wedding. In verse 13 says, The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. And that's probably enough. But that's the wedding song. Then we have this one from Zephaniah, the song of the love of the judgment. <clears throat> um, in in um, Zephaniah, we have, this is one of my favorite, in fact, I think it is the, my favorite um, passage that deals with the singing Savior. And uh, beginning with verse 11, he says, In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness, speak no lies, nor shall be deceit, a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down. No one shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your hand, your heart. O king, boy, O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your judgments, or punishments, I think the NIV, NIV says. He has cast out your enemy, the king of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let your hands not be weak. And then I like verse 17. I've got this in the King James. <laughs> the Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. He is mighty. He will save. He will re rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Tremendous passage. <clears throat> I had, uh, I think I've shared before that I had <clears throat> misgivings about God. I thought he was waiting, or not waiting, but trying to keep as many out of, out of heaven as he possibly could. From a teenager, I knew if, when I died, I'd go straight to hell and burn forever. <laughs> and so that was, <clears throat> that was my idea of God. And I read, I was reading E.J. Wagoner, and he combined the, uh, <clears throat> the um, singing in the parables of the long, lost sheep that was recovered, the coins that were recovered, and the lost son that was recovered. And he coupled it with this, and I said, that can't be. <laughs> so I looked at the parables, and then I looked at this, and I said, this is absolutely amazing. I believe it. <laughs> that God, this is the picture of God singing. I want to hear that song. Right. And the picture I have in my mind, <clears throat> and it's going to take place at the wedding fe feast itself, that all of God's people from every age, every nation, every, clim every, every climate, are going to sing tremendously at that time. And then there's going to be a moment of silence. And God himself is going to break into a solo that's never been sung before. He's going to be sing over his redeemed from all the ages. Now, I've got some spiritual prophecy statements to deal with that. In fact, Review and Herald, 5-7-1908, um, she says, this is the testimony that the Lord desires us to bear to the world. And it's this song of Zephaniah 3.17. In Desire of Ages 834, Jesus approaches the Father 
with whom there is joy over one sinner that repents, who rejoices over one with singing. The Father himself, the 60, 125, the Father himself joys over the rescued one with singing. Here's one for students. If you students will heed the instruction given you in the word of God, you may go forth with a development of intellectual and moral power that will cause even angels to rejoice and God will joy over you with singing. Is that good news? <laughs> Tremendous. <clears throat> then, probably, I'm going to skip down, I've got another one, it's a little longer, but this one. Heaven and earth shall unite in the Father's song of rejoicing. I want to be there for that song, Amen. to hear that solo and then to enter in. It's, it'll be a song we've never sung either, <laughs> but it'll be created in, the, in an instant as we're rejoicing before God. That's from Christ Object Lessons, page uh, 207. So this is, this is the message to Laodicea, for Laodicea. And when Christ says, as many as I love and rebuke, chasten, it's out of love. And he wants us to grow up from being a flower girl <laughs> so we can stand before him as the bride and hear his love song over us in the song of the Father as they join together, I'm sure, over the, in the rejoicing. They want us in heaven more than we want to be there. <laughs> and one day it's going to be complete. And it appears that it may be in our lifetime or some of our lifetimes. Some of those gray beards may go to the grave, but, but um, uh, the, the world cannot last much longer. Just from the standpoint of what's going on, it cannot last. Um, even with the population explosion, it cannot support uh, what they're predicting in the next 50 to 75 years. The message we've got today is one that will, ought to grip our hearts and that will prepare us to give the three angels' message of Revelation 14 and chapter 18, verse 1. And with that, I think we'll, we'll close for tonight. And that's part four. And probably I'll end with that part of the message to Laodicea. But Christ is the message and the messenger to the church of Laodicea, his bride. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we want to thank you so much for your word. We're thankful that Jesus is the messenger and the message for us and to us. And we thank you in his precious name. Save us in spite of ourselves. Amen. 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 Amen.